Our next speaker is, uh, is uh, Sharon Hill, the lovely Sharon Hill. She uh, is doing a talk called The Honest Broker of Doubtful News. She is a uh, geologist. Uh, she, of course, runs the great news blog, Doubtful News. Uh, she's one of the few geologists that tuned into my podcast, the Geologic Podcast, thinking it was about geology. <laughs> and uh, she stuck around, which is very nice. Uh, uh, her talk, like I said, is called The Honest Broker of Doubtful News. Her haiku is a geologist walks out of a bar and says, make mine on the rocks. Please welcome Sharon Hill. That's totally true, by the way. I did think it was a geologic podcast. So this is a talk about positive skepticism, about feeling compelled to do things that hopefully make a difference, and if not, eh, at least I learned a little bit along the way. So back in August of 2011, I started the Doubtful News website to tackle weird news stories from a skeptical angle. And my goal for the project was to have a one-stop site for those who, like me, like me, loved weird and strange news stories and wanted to keep up on the latest pseudoscience and paranormal and hoaxed information that was flying across the web. I'd already been following um, weird news sites but not one captured all the interesting stories and more importantly provided a forum to uh, discuss them or to discover if they were actually valid. And we could all go, wow, that's amazing. So when I envisioned the, the Doubtful News Project, DN I'll call it, I saw it as an alternative to credulous or mystery mongering media sites. When I see a paranormal or anomaly story, I'm curious about what actually happened. Not many news outlets bother to explore that angle. They hardly ever follow up on like, what some mysterious phenomenon turned out to be. Like for example, when, when a UFO turns out to be Chinese lanterns or a hoax, I try to do that. I try to find out what really happened. And sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. So with one faithful co-editor, editor, thanks T, who inc incidentally I met here at TAM, and a few others who volunteered their assistants, supporters who spread the word and were very encouraging and a lot of dedication and work to seek out this information day after day. The site topped a million page views about a year later and we're on track to hit 4,500 posts at about the two year mark, which is about six posts on average per day. Thanks. <laughs> So it's always been an experiment and a valuable learning experience. And there's, there's always more to the story than we're given in the media. And it's not just about facts. It's about people, their perception, interpretation, and about how the media packages this for the public. And I learned how others of opposing view uh, look at these stories and, and, and how they're, they're packaged for the public. And, and, and I learned, interacting with them, I discovered the importance of effectively communicating a message. And I'm not saying I always do it right, but I understand some best practices. And the message of this talk is that it's, it's, it's personal because our own experiences are personal and complicated. And I hope you take away whatever lessons are meaningful for you. So, DN, Doubtful News, is a uh, news critique site as well as an aggregator, and it's where you can go to find critical thinking take on these news stories, where the readers can consider what is being presented in the news story and ask what might be wrong, misleading, intriguing, or important about it. I'm not a journalist. I'm more like a content analyst, media critic, science advocate. And in highlighting a news story on DN, I often add supplementary information from reliable sources, and the official news story often leaves, leaves out that kind of information. And sometimes I have contradictory information, or I have a say about how good or bad the piece is compared to what the rest of the evidence suggests, and how this particular portrayal might influence the public's perception. When you begin a project, along with having some clear goals and methods in mind, you should think about the values you wish to promote. What are you advocating for? Why even do this project? I value scientific skepticism. And I didn't want to be misguided on that idea, so I researched it to get a handle on the concept. And with the cooperation of several knowledgeable people, uh, I ended up producing the 
Media Guide to Skepticism, which spells it out in an easy, gra e easy to grasp language in a two-page takeaway, and I encourage you to check that out. Uh, it's at the document at the top menu of doubtfulnews.com. Take it home, make it yours, good for a handout if you have meetings or if you have a public event. Feel free to use it however you wish. And another thing I, I valued was to reach the public. That's the audience I was going for. I mean, it, it comes with its own set of con considerations. For one, I couldn't just promote it in the skeptosphere. That's a start, but to expand, I had to do more than just appeal to this circle. So I looked for and connected with other populations, such as the paranormal crowd. And for the general web surfer, I maximized best practices for search engines. And my idea was that when people interested in any aspect of the story uh, Googled it, perhaps they came across the DN version of the story that provided additional information and unique angles that they wouldn't see in the mainstream piece. And I've heard from people to whom that has actually happened, so that's rewarding. Like, I'll put a link to science-based medicine in there, and they'll actually click on the link and, and, and go there to find out more about the subject. And imp uh, another important aspect I value is uh, civility and respect for people in the discussion. So with a diverse audience, the public, it was necessary to keep an even tone not use derogatory words to describe people, unless they actually were convicted of fraud or exposed as unethical, and some were. So I have this strict policy that states DN is not a forum for angry debate. It is a discussion where knowledgeable input is requested. And by the way, the comments on the site are often spectacular because they are by people who are part of the news story or experts in the subject who find the site and, and come on to comment. And the comments are also safe to read. They're not infuriating or nasty, so I'm proud of that. When it was time to upgrade to DN 2.0, I conducted a survey of my readers, because feedback is important. Are you doing this right? Is there anything you can make better? And most of the people said they liked the way it was, with a bit of commentary, not hard-hitting debunking, but an understanding tone. And some people thought I was too skeptical or too critical, and others thought I was too soft. So this led to some confusion, like, what, what side was I on? Am I a skeptic? And you know, do I believe this stuff? You know, I'm, I'm a big Bigfoot fan, so I, I like to talk about it a lot. But it's complicated. When, when you're in between what looks like feuding factions, say skeptics and believers, not quite fitting in either place, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You, you avoid groupthink. Let's call it a unique voice. And I look at lots of views, and that I think is the, under, the key to understanding a subject. You have to see all sides. There's not just two, there's usually more than two. And I'm okay with being in the middle ground. I'm sympathetic to people who believe in stuff that perhaps I don't believe in. So I'll, I'll come back to voice and why it's of great importance in activism, but first I'd like to address objectivity. We all think that's a great thing, but it can go wrong. In the 19th century, the idea of objective news caught on. Stories from the big media sources became less biased and more neutral in order to attract new readers and advertisers. You can imagine that when there's this limited set of viewers uh, and choices, this makes sense because it's best the product not be controversial and opinionated. News was facts and history was very straightforward. Well, times have changed. You know, today there's so much choice and so many viewers that it makes sense to actually tailor your feed to certain niches. And news is now more entertainment and punditry. Emotional outbursts, controversy, sensationalism sells. And we have this polarized media in the US, liberal and conservative, for example. And we have these media sources that often only present their discrete view. And because of this polarization, we often lack the opportunity to actually consider the issue fully from all sides. So objectivity was a clever business move back in the day, and it became easy and cheaper as in-depth investigations look like bias. So just give the facts as you find them, and then you, the reader, decide. Problem with you decide is that you can only choose based on what is given. And asking the audience to decide is only fair if all the options are represented honestly and completely. And this is hard to do in the space of today's media landscape because such, such a time constraint of a TV show, 
uh, for example, it's, and it's deliberately not done if the aim is towards pleasing an audience with a specific ideology. So the You Decide gambit is, 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 sounds great, but it's, it's not all that great. And it can be played using false balance as well, which is giving equal weight to things that don't really have equal supporting evidence. So You Decide is viewed as democratic and empowering, but it's often a manipulative ploy. You're given speculative or dramatic information to spark reaction or outrage. Ever notice how, how attack, uh, political attack ads end with, uh, do you want so-and-so running your whatever? You decide. You know, after they've just bombarded you with very skewed presentation of information, you decide based on what you're just given. So we know that emotion can distort a message, but objectivity can surprisingly potentially distort as well. Attempts at objectivity can slide into sloppy thinking or non-thinking. And you know, we've all read articles where the author has taken his source at face value, just repeated the quote, no explanation, no verification, or worse, these days, news outlets are reprinting press releases word for word. This is what was said, no counter, no critique is given. I could do that too, it'd be a lot less work, but it would also be boring and pointless uh, relating to my goals. So objectivity is a good premise most of the time. Just like scientific skepticism, it, it keeps us out of trouble. But when we talk about inspiring change, which is what activism is, you can't be positive or negative, if you wish, if you're neutral. You don't move forward very fast sitting in neutral. You have to put it in gear and give it some gas. So for my purposes, objectivity is used with regards to the evidence, but being objective without adding content, context, and color commentary would not be a force for change. Although some people would like to see DN just give the facts and point out errors in the news that's presented, that's not my vision. My aim is to get people thinking and hopefully to change minds about harmful things or nonsense. And this is really important. People need to know what you are saying and why they should care. You can gather all the facts and information in the world, but if no one is going to get the message or pay attention to it, you might as well not have bothered. I mean, if I tell the facts about vaccination rates going down without any context, that doesn't grab the average person. The human element, the emotion of parents who have faced their child's illness or death is the gripping part of the story. It's the dramatic consequence. The, the vehement anti-vaccinationists grasp this concept. The anti-science lobbyists effectively use emotion, often in place of good evidence, and they certainly don't keep their opinions to themselves. They are raving and passionate, and you can find thousands of examples every day of, of news stories that pander to the way people feel and to their fears, because it's effective. And skeptical thinking is void of sensationalism, and that's commendable, but the unfortunate outcome may be a less than gripping presentation of pretty serious stuff that may not reach the people it needs to reach. When objectivity ends up looking like apathy, readers may completely miss the point or misinterpret the message. If you help the audience see what's important to them, they are more likely to follow along with the idea you are attempting to put across. So use your values to enhance the message. Because if I'm going to put this much effort into a project, I want people to find it and pay attention. If I just wrote objective facts, it'd be dull and people would pass it, pass it by. So this is where the voice of my site comes in. Now because of my personal interest in subject area, I already, which is like the paranormal, I already curate DN in a particular way. It already has a lean to it. Uh, the default take on extraordinary claims is, is not going to be one of hype and mystery mongering. It's going to be doubt with emphasis on the evidence and what it tells us. Like I said, I'm okay with people's beliefs, even if they're odd, as long as they don't affect others. But I do feel humans would benefit if we were less credulous uh, uh, about the world, within reason. But I don't want to bash people over the head with this concept. I, I try to convey the message that I, I wanted people to come to the site and talk, to contact me, tell me what they think. We can have a, a civil discussion. It can happen. I've had many discussions with paranormal believers and those still on the proverbial fence. 
And I think it's critical to engage with those of different views. And I deliberately reached out to the paranormal sites, asking them to come to my site, share it, and see what their readers thought. Some of them came and some of them liked it. There were some disputes and tense moments, but I thought I was making progress. And I tried to maintain the site voice as one of openness and curiosity, getting to the bottom of the mystery uh, or question. And, and I, I made inroads with some pro-paranormal people who saw me as the, hey, you're OK, kind of reasonable skeptic. And if I liked their stuff, I cross-referenced it. I, I cross-promoted some of their sites as well. And I didn't view Dean as a competitor to them, but more like complementary. No one site was like mine, so I thought, no harm, no foul. I'm just a different perspective. Yet. The straw man of skepticism made an appearance. Blatant prejudice against the stereotypical idea of skepticism is rampant in the paranormal community. So the tint of skepticism, no matter how slight, was enough for Doubtful News to be pigeonholed as a skeptic blog. And this was partially my fault. Uh, it's the way I marketed it. For a while, it was even mirrored on skeptic.com. But I, I, I like the big tent. I, I have room for all. I'm trying to expand my audience, not narrow it. And I hope the paranormal crowd would feel the same way. Maybe we could have this cross-pollination in some discussion. It's challenging, yes, to engage with opposite views, but it's usually pretty rewarding and enlightening. When Dean started to become more popular, where references to my site were side by side with their sites, and I was commenting on their sites with additional information I had contrary to their information, trouble began. DN wasn't being promoted on some paranormal sites anymore. They criticized the site as being a skeptic site, capital S, as if that's a bad word. I clearly intruded on their turf, and they weren't happy about that. Hey, guess what? Not everybody interested in these subjects really wants to know the truth about their pet subject area. Many just want validation of what they believe is true. They'd rather live with their beloved ideas intact than pick them apart. Yes, I get that. I understand. I knew this about the public in general. But it can be considerably worse for those who consider themselves experts or knowledgeable, and they're invested in it. They actually lack a huge chunk of knowledge, the, the skeptical literature. They don't read it. And sadly, they, they revel in that ignorance at times. And I think that's a shame. You know, if you really want an answer, that, that feels intellectually dishonest to me. Some paranormalists, you know, the ghost hunters and the Bigfoot chasers, came right out and told me, why don't you skeptics go cure cancer or something? Leave us alone. Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> I realized two important things about this particular population niche, the, the paranormal crowd. One, they aren't used to or comfortable with people knowledgeably engaging them face to face about problems with their findings or philosophy. You know, I got, I got a question about this. What are you talking about? Two, there is no discrete middle to occupy in some of these areas. It's, it's curious. It's a sliding scale, not two sides with the fence in the middle. And people move across that scale depending upon the subject area. Paranormalists love when you advocate against alt-med and bad consumer products. They hate when you tell them to stop it with the pseudoscience and produce some real evidence. And for as irritated as I get when they tell me how to do science, they get peeved when I tell them I have an alternate explanation for the phenomenon and you're likely mistaken. So there was some drama, and, and I, I was making some paranormal people angry by calling them out on stuff. And, and I was going through a phase where I was feeling frustrated with them, and perhaps I was poking the dragon a bit. But drama happens. So what? Life goes on, live and learn. Don't get bogged down in the drama. But the drama prompted me to evaluate what I wanted. Did I want to continue the effort to be on good terms with both sides? Because it, it was draining. It's difficult. Did, did I want to be a popular site, or did I want to stick to my original task, and was that those two things exclusive? I didn't want to compromise my, my original goals, and I wasn't going to conform to what others wanted because it would be impossible to please everyone. I was going to be myself. 
They can engage with me or not, whatever they wanted, and that's what I decided. And in short order, the prickly portion of my uh, audience fell away. That's okay. You know, it's worthwhile to listen to constructive criticism and adjust your actions accordingly, but I can only go so far. So this brings me to two very important concepts that I learned that really helped me understand information and communication. The first is worldview. Worldview is important to remember when you're talking to another person about a disputed subject. Realize that their vision of the world is very different than yours, depending on the journey to get to where they are right now. Information we get every day is just bits and pieces. Often it has no context, no meaning to you or anyone else unless you give it meaning. And think about how we can have the same exact data set and give it to two different people and they come up with different conclusions about it depending on many personal factors, biases, experience, training, values, uh, you know, et cetera. We saw this happen with climate data, with parapsychology results, and in this case with sonar data because I see a log and the tourist boat, boat caps, captain sees the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> but we take this information we get and fit it into our worldview and our preconceptions and that's how we make sense of it. And if it doesn't fit, we usually discard it. And, and the experts at this are conspiracy theorists. So here's an, an interesting example that reflects the media behavior as well as a worldview. There was a news story not too long ago about a Chinese plane that experienced this sudden thud at 26,000 feet in the air. And the pilots were having trouble at that point. They made an emergency landing to find that the nose of the plane was pushed in as if they ran into something, but they didn't see anything at the time. And there was no indication of what could have hit the plane. So the ever-vigilant tabloids knew a great story when they saw it and filled in the knowledge gap with the extraordinary. The plane had an encounter with a UFO. That became the story. Air China plane hits UFO. Since UFO automatically translates as alien spacecraft, oh my gosh, the airspace is unsafe, they're attacking our planes. It was a plane with a dent. I reminded people it was a plane with a dent. It's an interesting story, an unsolved mystery, yes. Let's find out what happened, not jump to unwarranted conclusions. But for those who have room in their worldview for alien spacecraft, this story can be placed right in and taken the way it was delivered without any critical thought. Now it bolsters their worldview, another piece in their puzzle. And it got me thinking back to what I find to be a slightly disturbing quote by Darwin who said, how odd is it that anyone should not see that all observation must be for or against some view if it is to be of any surface? It'd be nice to think that at least some observations are objective, but are they really? I mean, observations are made by people, and we all have our framework of interpretation, even in mundane observations, and we can't help it. So some people think I should stick with the facts. The plane has a dent, that's the story. But don't call attention to the fringe aspect, but it doesn't work, there has to be context. I must be upfront in saying, I'm telling another part of the story. I take these pieces of information I find from various sources, look at different angles, and based on fact and evidence, provide alternative options for explanation. And I'm not the cynic or contrarian, even though some people assume this. My role is not to dismiss. My role is to be the honest broker of potential options. And this is the second important concept that I learned, resonated with me from studying science and policy. The honest broker is a concept taken from a book by Roger Pelkey. It integrates knowledge with public concern to provide possible alternatives. It's a policy role that I adopted for my writing that provides alternatives and potential outcomes based on what factors we choose to apply to the issue. And considering that things are complex in the world, you have disparate audiences with different values among them. It's the role I see as the most socially conscious. Human decisions are best informed by science, but we have to take into account social issues, emotions, ethics, humanity, perceptions, fact and feeling, or else it won't be broadly accepted. So as an honest broker, the options are expanded, not restricted. The thinking is open-minded, not closed. And it's a positive role. Given an array of options to think about, one which may be accepting that we don't know, and it's a good start towards compromise. The honest broker role requires 
experience and informed opinion about what is credible and valid or nonsense. And if I don't have that experience for the subject, I'll be honest. I ask that others help me out. Crowdsourcing works. We often get fantastic and informed input on DN stories. And this additional input offers those looking to decide for themselves a better array of options to consider based on science, reason, and sound evidence. You aren't being spoon-fed a story. You're being presented with the options should you choose to consider them. So it's not been easy to take this role. Like I said, many in the audience prefer only their confirmation of their beliefs, and they don't want to hear anything that messes with their worldview and threatens their outlook. I don't think that's honest, but I think this is the reasonable approach, and it's right for me. So with a voice of scientific skepticism and a role of honest broker, here I am doing my thing. Why do it? Is it worth it? Those who advocate contrarian ideas or fringe views are actively seeking fertile ground for their seeds or weeds to germinate. Pseudoscience, conspiracy, junk science, scams and hoaxes are being pushed on us every day, all the time, and many people fall for them. And they sacrifice their health or mental well-being, their money, and their hope. And I don't see how we can afford to just sit around and be neutral or passive about science and critical thinking. It needs supporters and cheerleaders, and I choose to be an advocate for critical thinking because I love the subject areas and I want to get the best answer, and I don't want people to be fooled. I think it's better for all of us in society if we don't buy into things that are untrue. I mean, how angry do you get when people aren't giving their children modern health care? You know, two children die in a faith-healing family because their parents belong to a church that believed in God's will to heal. What's it matter to you? They're not your kids. It matters. I care about society as a whole. What about when rhinos are killed for their horns and other animals are tortured or butchered to produce nonsense Chinese medicine treatments? It matters. We're citizens of Earth. We have a responsibility. And I get angry when people brush off those responsibilities for their own ends or market it with mistaken ideas. Even just being the one to explain that a perceived experience with demons or ghosts or Bigfoot may have an alternate explanation is part of a responsibility. If you know something about this topic, share it. Share the science-based alternative. They may choose to consider it or not. And I wonder like, how many people would have been helped if they knew that sleep paralysis was real. You know, they probably would have been less traumatized from their personal events. So taking the skeptical perspective, looking at the evidence, is not one that will make you beloved or popular. No matter how tactful you try to be, you will make enemies of people who are just angry that you disagreed with them or mad that the evidence you put out there undermines their claim. That happens to me a lot, like every day. You'll get threats from those who think that disagreeing or uncovering errors and pointing out bad science is personal defamation. They're afraid of losing their ground, so they attack you. And you may become so outraged that you want to attack them instead of the claim. And that usually doesn't work out very well. There's too much outrage theater in the world today. It's distracting from doing productive things like solving the problems. So let's face it, if you spend all your time attacking some other, whether that be the opposing view, religious, scientific, pseudoscientific, or your skeptical colleagues, you aren't going to produce a whole lot of anything other than animosity. Keep things in perspective, put your views out there, and don't take the backlash personally. Too many people confuse critique of the claim with a personal attack, and this is a huge lesson we'd all do well to learn. Okay, so time to wrap this up in a neat package for you to take home. Your unique voice is important. Find what voice suits you and how to best use it. And I advocate demonstrating to the world that skeptic need not be the heartless, mean, vehemently objective slave to reason. You are human. You have feelings and values. Acknowledge others' values and worldview. Let them have their own voice, and they might be more willing to listen to yours. Think about your goals and be true to yourself, not what someone else says you should be. Be the honest broker and serve up multiple options in an understanding way. 
and provide a positive path with critical thinking and skeptical activism. So now go on, go out there, be inspired, have your say, do good stuff. Thank you. Sharon Hill, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, be inspired. Congratulations. Uh,